that. Hopefully lunch coma is not setting in for you guys. Um, so I'm here to talk about a project that I do in a junior level class, combining type and image, and this particular assignment was interpreting constitutional amendments. Um, the backstory is these students are juniors, most are, it's a required class for all the visual communication designers in the program, but we also have interaction designers and industrial designers, and so there are a few of those that take it as an elective. They would have had one sophomore class before a 60-person class, so they know what kerning and leading and those kinds of things are, but they forget a lot of it over the summer. It's 26 students, two sections of this class. So in this, I usually run three to four projects. Some of it is mobile screen-based typography. Others are posters. We talk about type as a form of expression, uh, type as practical, typesetting long chunks of te text. So these are some examples of some of the projects that they've done. This was the brief that I gave them, which was to design a poster representing one of the 27 amendments in the US Constitution. They could remind people of its original purpose and importance, raise awareness about a particular issue related to the amendment, call for a change to the amendment itself, and their audience was students at UW. It's about three weeks. I start with a lecture about combining type and image. We do an in-class exercise, and then the rest of the time is based on class crit, all class crits, or one or two desk crits, and we meet twice a week. Deliverables, pretty straightforward, a 16 by 22 inch poster. This could have been bigger, but I try to be aware of costs for them, and we have some Epson printers that print 17 by 24, so this allows them to full bleed it. Um, so it's a slightly random size, but it, it helps them cost-wise. So this was last fall, and about this time in the news, we've got Trump attacking everyone in the press, so free speech is under attack. We had the protests in Charlottesville, Virginia. Harvey Weinstein has been arrested uh, or has been called out for his sexual harassment. Uh, Colin Kaepernick and the NFL are right up there in the news for taking a knee. And then we had the shootings in Las Vegas that took place maybe one or two days before uh, I assigned this project. So plenty of fodder in the news for the students to pull from. The learning objectives for me, this is always framing around how do they combine type and image because most visual communication designers are going to have to work with text and image together. And so I work with a book, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Scolas Waddell type image message book, uh, but the purpose that I give them is to understand the power of type uh, as a way of creating image, but also just combining type and image and then to help them learn to work at a large size, and again, 16 by 22 isn't a particularly large size, but it's bigger than the eight and a half by 11 that they're used to, or a small mobile. And then we want to encourage them to engage the viewer at various distances, and I imagine some of you teach in a similar way. You might have heard of this rule, the 10, 30, 10, three rule, or 50, 10, five, however you frame it, but it's basically, from 30 feet away, a student or a reader should see something that attracts them to bring them to the 10 feet where they get something else to get them to the 3 feet, which gets them something else. And a lot of my students will design for the 30 feet and never get any closer, or they'll design for the 3 feet and never draw the, the viewer in. So we try to talk about how can you have something different on your poster or your piece at these various distances. So I start off my lecture talking about the differences between type and image, and as we've heard this morning a lot about typography, it's language made visible, it's learned, and so in the case of our class, we're talking about singular geometric letter forms that combine to create words, then sentences, usually read left to right, at least in, in English. And images represent the physical world, and I often put up pictures of my kids or, or a dog, and I'll say, you come with your own, you know, experiences. So you might think, oh, I miss my dog, or I hated trick-or-treating at Halloween. You all come with your biases. So we talk about that uh, when you're using type and image together. This is the book that I pull from my lecture. And is anybody in here familiar with this book or has seen it? It's from 2006. And man, I would love it if they would update this book because it's got terrific content, but it's a lot of images that are now, you know, 
12 years old. So it would be nice if you know Nancy and Tom, push them to do a second edition. But in there, there's actually a really great way to talk to students about these four ways to combine type and image. And for those of you that are familiar with the book, sit tight, I'm gonna do a super fast explanation. Uh, one of the first ones is separation. So separation is where the type and image just operate independently. And this is a, a you know, an hour long lecture for me when I'm condensing it into about two minutes. Type remains on its own layer. Type is placed in compartments or windows, and this is super useful if you have a complicated background or especially in mobile or screen-based type. And then the type can react to an image but remain on its own layer. So these are some examples of that, and you can imagine, again, if you have a, a picture or a photograph that's got a lot going on, some of your students might struggle with how do I fit type on there that can read. And so these shapes, the red shapes, or on the right, that's actually a screenshot from a mobile app just using bars. And this is, you'll, you'll find it everywhere, especially in screen-based stuff. The middle one is an example of where the type is operating on its own layer. It's almost not acknowledging the images back behind. So I hope that by showing them lots of examples along the way, they can start to see, okay, this is separation. Fragmentation is another one. This is where the type and the image disrupt one another or displace one another. So here are some examples of that. This is a poster on the left, An Sang Su for Hangul Day. You can see the letter forms are actually being interrupted by the building or they're in front of the, uh, of the street. You know, on the right, I think the challenge here for the students is how can you still see the letter forms and how can the letter forms and the imagery engage one another in a more interesting way than just a layer sitting on top? So this is a way to talk about, again, fragmentation, combining type and image. The third one is fusion, and this is where they merge into one entity, and it's almost like fusing, it, it makes sense. It's sort of on the skin, it fuses to the surface, so they share a surface or a texture, or they might even be connected through space. So on the left, this is a good way for you to maybe introduce a, a variety of designers that you've seen or historically. So this is Philippe Apolog on the left, but it's a famous poster that he's done by just creating the same perspective with the typography. Uh, the middle one, you know, the letter forms themselves are being affected in, by the, the shapes, the lines, the, the paint-like um, blue stuff that's in there, whatever that is. And I don't think you can get much more fused than Stefan Sagmeister's poster uh, where his intern actually etched the letters onto him with an X-Acto blade. Uh, so that's fused on the skin, literally. And then the final one is inversion, and this is where type and image trade roles. The type becomes the image. And so examples of that are, you know, uh, hand-drawn letter forms. This is actually the project on the right, or the poster on the right is a project I do with sophomores in typography where they have to pick a line from a song and then make the letter forms. But it's where the type is starting to do the work for you as opposed to the photographs or the imagery that's back behind it. So we do the, we, I go through those four, and then I have the students bring in their own images, and we just do a, an in-class exercise where I, I give them a quote, and I've got an hour to basically try and combine type and image using the four different methods. And, you know, most of it's pretty crappy stuff, you can imagine, but it's, it's a pretty quick exercise for them to even start to articulate why is one different than another. Almost everyone, top left is separation, and then we've got fragmentation down below, fusion up right, and then the type is image. They almost always just resort to a typeface and mask the image in, which is a lame way to do it, but that's how they're starting. I show them lots of examples of type on posters. We look at unit editions. We go to typographic posters. So I've, I've got lots of examples for them. So I'm, I'm primed and ready in critique one where I say present two to three different concepts. So at this point, they would have had to pick their amendment, do some research on it. Um, and then show these initial concepts. Uh, don't try and get bogged down in the perfect kerning or the right color. Um, but we want to know what your idea is, uh, rather than I'm sure plenty of your students will put up stuff and then spend 20 minutes talking about what they want to do, but there's nothing up there for us to talk about because they haven't tried to visually translate it. But inevitably, what do they all do? They resort to images first. And so this is an example of process work from one student starting from first crit, moving along. I'll show you more images. They all resort to images, and, and I have spent so much time. This is a particular student who was dealing with the Second Amendment and gun rights. And so this is actually a picture of him. He hasn't been affected by guns in any way, but you're, you're left wondering, 
what do I do with this text and, and what do the numbers mean? Was he shot six times? Like it's, you don't, they're having a hard time figuring out what their ideas are here. And that's obviously part of the process. Um, moving along, he started to get a better sense of what he wanted to say, which was that the NRA was somehow distorting the Second Amendment. And so he's actually got the text from the Second Amendment back behind. And, and I'm doing critiques here, these are group critiques, reminding them, how can the type do the work for you? Why is it that you have to rely on a single image? What can text do for you? And so he's got you know, images of guns, but if you're saying NRA, maybe guns aren't needed. Um, so it's sort of a matter of when can you show something and when can you say something. And so what he ended up with was this one, which is that, and you can see a well-regulated militia that's part of the Second Amendment, that text in the back, and it's being distorted by the NRA, which is sitting up top. So he's working on that 30, 10, 3 kind of read. And around the outside, this is a detail of the outside, he is highlighting the various congressmen who are receiving money from the NRA. And at the time, there was a quote from John Thule, who's Republican, who said, in the case of a shooting, get small. So that's actually what this small text is that's in the center. So he's kind of worked hard to sort of combine, it's all text at this point, but to create that, that various levels of the read. This was another student, and he was all over the map. Again, this is process, but you know, when you stick a picture of Melania Trump up there in Handmaiden's Tale, we're not going where he wants us to go. And this was about the 19th Amendment and that everyone has the right to vote at the time. Um, and so it just became a very confusing for him to rely on images rather than text, trying to talk about women's rights in the middle. And part of this is them trying to figure out what their exact idea is along with being able to visualize it. So he moved then later into Angela Davis, who's a political activist, trying to sort of put text in there that people would read, but of course then we have debates about, well, how much text do you want on a poster and are people gonna actually come up and read all of this? Again, starting to hassle him on how can you make type do the work because he's trying to get across the idea that no matter what group you're part of, whether you're handicapped, LGBT, uh, a woman, whatever race you are, you all have the right to vote. And so rather than try and find one image that ends up being cliched, he started to play with words. And this was his final solution, um, which I thought was actually quite strong in terms of just being able to engage people from various distances and let the type do the work for you. Another student, this was, uh, there were other process works in between, but she was playing with the idea of Colin Kaepernick and taking a knee, but again, starting on the left with fairly cliched images, uh, moving again into the middle. You also can't get terribly good quality images for a large poster. So she ended up with a version on the right. She had many versions in between that looked a little like the Death Star in being constructed with the typography. But these were quotes from Colin Kaepernick. How could he get across the idea of football or she could get the idea of football across without actually showing that. Um, so being able to understand that maybe typography can do some of that work for you. A few more examples. This was a student that was going after the First Amendment but also using Colin Kaepernick, just the idea of him being able to take a knee. So his text is the white text, but she's also used Martin Luther King um, his text is the black text, and she was trying to get across the idea that um, struggle is a part of progress. And so she's actually got both of them there, and this becomes a matter of, okay, you didn't need an image of a football. You could get across the idea through the, the grid structure on a football field. Uh, and then she has the, the text in there from the First Amendment. A few others, uh, you know, again, raising generation hate. How can you, this was after the First Amendment, this was, uh, there was an uptick in um, bullying and students, especially in elementary schools, uh, bullying other kids about race and, and gender um, after Trump was elected. And so just playing the scale of typography on the right was gun control, the idea that it is complicated, that there's two sides. I thought this one was a little less successful because you just read complicated, but you don't get much more, I think. You know it's guns and complicated. 
These two were about right to privacy. So again, along the way, as we're critiquing, we're talking about what are the ways you're combining type and image so you can see fragmentation is being used on the left. You still have to be able to read the word commodity. This was about students and right to privacy. And the one on the right was about um, the government, um, how they're actually using technology to collect some information from you. We have the power, he actually used, these are all googly eyes, those little googly eyes that move around, and so his actual poster has all googly eyes. It's hard to make them all look in the direction of DC, but it was the idea that states have the rights, have rights and power versus always just looking to the federal government. And then on the right, you know, the, the idea that, yes, you can get across pretty quickly, this is about Donald Trump, and this is about his view of, of freedom of speech, but distorting the type in some way rather than just sitting it on there and typesetting it neatly. So the students start to see, again, separation. How could I get that small type on there and have it be readable? So reflections in the project. The pros, I think, is it's a, it's a really useful way, or it has been a useful way for the students to learn about combining type and image. Um, and the students obviously get to choose a topic that they're interested in, which is good, rather than me assigning them all to the same one. The cons, I think, here are that some of the amendments tend to be a little more complex than others, and when only one or two students are working on one of the amendments, there maybe aren't enough people in the room to respond to them or give them more critical feedback on their specific topic. So if you were interested in trying this, you might either choose two or three of the amendments that are more popular and, and have them work on those. I will say that it, you know, in, in later classes that I have them, I can make it show up in the work. So I can remind them, wait, how are you combining type and image? And is there a better way to do that? And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the separation one I think works quite well, especially when you're on screen. They learn about the power of using type. So a lot of them, you know, again, they initially rely on images, but they start to realize, oh, the typography can actually do the work for me here, which is good. So I'm going to do a quick test with you guys on the far left. Uh, which one is that? Fusion, fragmentation, separation, inversion? Stuck on the skin on the far left. Fusion, right? <coughs> Excuse me, so that's Sagmeister. <coughs> what about the second one, Buck? It's type only, so it has to be inversion. Uh, what about the third one? Separation, right? <clears throat> so that's from the guilt group. But you can see if you have a complicated image, it's a lot easier to put those kind of shapes on there. And then on the right, far right, fragmentation, right? So <clears throat> I think there just is more depth when the image is in front or behind of the text. It just creates a little more interest. So thank you. <laughs>